Hello everyone and welcome back to another instructional video from EGIS Associates. Today we're going to get back to basics. Uh, we had a viewer from one of our earlier videos that really requested that we get in and kind of talk about the relationship between features, feature classes, and layers and how that all works. So that's what we're going to do in, in this video. We're going to kind of get back to those basics. As anyone that's worked in GIS knows, we do things a lot differently. We don't have a single file type or a single data format. Um, and this often causes confusion with new users coming in to, to GIS because they're used to, you know, with Word, you open a, a DOC or a DOCX file or Excel, an XLS file or an auto, you know, AutoCAD with DWG files or DGN files for MicroStation. They're used to that one file uh, that works with their application. And GIS just doesn't work that way. We have multiple file types, uh, multiple file formats, and we do this largely because of the size of the data we work with. In GIS, it's not uncommon to have a data set that is over one gigabyte in size. Um, we even approach terabytes. In, in some organizations, they may even get higher into petabytes worth of information. And if we tried to load all of that data into a single file, you would pretty much kill any computer, even some of the most powerful ones out there. So what we do in GIS is we divide those data sets out into individual files, into individual feature classes, into different data sources. Uh, and that also brings up the fact that in GIS, we try to leverage data that's coming from different locations. So we may pull data in from a web service, or we may pull data in from a local shapefile. We may pull data in from an enterprise database somewhere and bring all that in, mash it together in a single map so that we can then perform analysis, see relationships. And as a result, because this data is coming from all these different locations, you know, we have to be able to work with that effectively. So these are reasons why in GIS we don't have just a, a single file. You don't just open a, uh, a shape file or you just don't open a map file. All of these things are interrelated. So what we want to do now is really get into kind of the, the bare bones, right? The, the basic foundational understanding of when we're creating a map, what is a feature? what's a feature class and what's a, a layer and how they are related to one another. So a feature, which is kind of at the core of everything, is a representation of a real world item that could be a parcel, it could be a fire hydrant, it could be a zoning boundary, it could be a power pole, a transformer, um, and so on, right? It, it, it can represent any sort of real world item. And we're gonna do this by choosing how we represent it as either a point, a line, or a polygon. That feature is then also going to be linked to an attribute table or a database table in the back end so that various attributes associated with the feature are also collected and connected to that feature. So that if we select, as we see here in the slide, a parcel, then we can open the attribute table and see things like what's the lot number, what street is it on, you know, potentially we could have the owner's name, we have the uh, size in acres, we have fields for the centroid X and Y coordinate values. So we can control what attributes are connected to that feature. And they're gonna take a group of features, like parcels that you see here, and store those in a feature class. So a feature class is a collection of features that share the same geometry, meaning they're going to all be points, or they're all going to be lines, or they're all going to be polygons. In a single feature class, you cannot mix and match feature types or geometry types. So they all will be, again, points, or they'll be lines, or they will be polygons. So all of those features are grouped together usually based on what they are. Like you're gonna put all the water valves in one feature class and all the fire hydrants in one feature class, um, all the parcels in one feature class. Do you have to do it that way? No. Uh, for example, you can see the line uh, feature class illustration here on the slide where we're showing, looks like road right-of-ways. 
parcel boundary lines and some sort of utility line. Those are all lines. So they could theoretically all be stored in a single line feature class. We wouldn't want to do that because the other part of a feature class is that all the features share the same attribute table, that underlying database table. So to keep that table under control, meaning we don't have a list of fields or columns in it that extends you know, well off the screen of any computer, we tend to, to group like features in a feature class. So we would put the road right of ways and potentially the parcel boundaries, because those all form part of the, the boundary of a parcel in a single feature class. Uh, we would have water lines in a separate feature class from sewer lines um, and that kind of thing. Again, to try to keep the attribute table under control. Yes, theoretically, we can put all of those uh, in one feature class if we wanted to, but then your table is going to get out of control with the number of fields or columns it's got to contain in order to store all the information about the features in the feature class that you need to, to store and use and analyze. Okay? The other part of a feature class is that all of those features that are in that feature class are going to share the same spatial reference. So what does that mean? Spatial reference. It sounds like a big, big word, big term. It's really simple. It's they all share the same coordinate system. Now, there's a little more to it than that, but in very basic terms, they all share the same coordinate system. They're all in your local state plane coordinate, or they're all in UTM zone, whatever, uh, or they're in WGS 84, whatever your, you know, whatever coordinate system you assign to the feature class, when you create it, all the features in there are going to be stored in that feature class. Okay. Then we're going to, as we create the feature class, the feature class itself is actually going to be stored in a specific data format. Okay. So there are a lot of different formats that we can use in GIS, but the feature class is going to be stored in that. So let's talk a little bit quickly about different data storage formats that we use in GIS. So I'm going to touch on just three here. There is a lot more than just these three, but these are three of the most common, especially for those working inside of the Esri ArcGIS environment. So the, the first and probably, well, I'd say most common, but one of the most commons, especially for those, again, working in the ArcGIS platform, is the geodatabase. So the geodatabase is a relational database that stores uh, feature classes. A single geodatabase can store multiple feature classes. As you see here, we have a, a geodatabase that's called GIS underscore CAD underscore demo dot GDB. So that's a geodatabase. And then within that, um, we have feature classes. So you can see uh, we've got other groupings in here, um, feature data sets. Uh, but in the Royston feature data set, we have a city limits polygon feature class. We have a clip area polygon feature class. We have a road underscore CL line feature class. Uh, also down below that, you'll see a uh, HYD underscore fire, which is a point feature class. So those are all individual feature classes. So in each one of those, we have a collection of features that share the geometry, which is indicated by the icon there and that common attribute table and the same spatial reference. We can also work with CAD files. I know that most people in GIS or even in, in the CAD arena with engineer surveyors don't really think about a uh, AutoCAD file or a MicroStation file containing feature classes. But from the GIS perspective, it, it certainly does. And you can see that we have points, polygon, and a polyline, which is basically the same thing as a line, all stored in that one hydrants.dwg. And uh, in the world of Esri and ARC, whether it's ARC Map, ARC Catalog, or ARC GIS Pro, we uh, use blue icons to symbolize a CAD file, whether it's a DWG, a D DXF, or DGN. Those are all just CAD file data formats. Uh, DWG and DXF are associated mostly with AutoCAD from Autodesk. DGN comes from MicroStation from uh, Bentley, 
which is a competitor to AutoCAD, but they're all drafting packages used by surveyors and engineers and landscape architects and those types uh, for data. But we can pull that information in uh, to our GIS and, and use it, whether it's, it's Esri or others like uh, QGIS, uh, Manifold and all that can also utilize some of these very same formats. And then we have shape files. That's a good old Esri format, probably the most common GIS format out there because all GIS software can pretty much read a shape file. Uh, a shape file is going to store a single feature class. So it's going to be a point shape file, a line shape file, uh, or a polygon shape file. I actually have uh, videos both on shape files and geodatabases that I'll link in the description below. So if you're not familiar with either one of those, uh, you can go to those videos and, and watch them. Geodatabase one's actually a three-part series I did several years ago. It was actually one of the first uh, video series we've done on this channel. So make sure you have links to, to that. So we've got features. Features are stored in feature classes. Those feature classes are then stored in a specific data format, be it a geodatabase, a CAD file, or a shape file, or something else like a KML from Google, or a MID or MIF file from MapInfo, uh, coverage files from old ArcInfo GIS. So again, we're going to put that. So how does that all relate to a layer? Well, a layer is how we visualize the features that are in our feature class. So we're going to add the feature class to a map. And when we do that, it becomes a layer. The layer then references back to the original feature class. So in this example you see on the slide here, we have a parcels layer that has been added to our map. That layer is going to reference or point back to the parcels feature class that is in our geodatabase. In this case, it's in the tripville underscore GIS geodatabase. So the layer doesn't actually store the data. It just controls how we visualize it within our map. So this can include the symbology. In this uh, case, you can see we've got it with a light green fill uh, in a kind of a gray uh, outline. And we can also control the attribute vi field visibility. So those columns that are in the attribute table, we can choose whether we want those visible or not visible. And again, that's a property of the layer. We can control labels, which are text based off values we find in the attribute field. We can control scales at which the layer turns on and off automatically. We call those scale visibility ranges. We can apply filters so we only see certain data based on a query that we build. This is called a definition query. And there's a whole lot more, but a layer just controls how we visualize the data that's in the feature class. How do those individual features look? as well as the attribute data associated with it. So they they don't store the data. Uh, and this is something that is uh, very confusing that layers and maps don't store data. They just point to data, okay? Uh, and that does bring up the bigger picture is that a layer is then stored in a map. As you can see here, we've got the map at the top of the contents there. And then the various layers underneath it. Right. And then each layer is going to point back to its reference, its data uh, that it's where it's stored. Right. Okay. So hopefully that makes some sense. And we can see that here as the full relationship. So again, we've got features, all the individual features. We've chosen to store them as either points, lines or polygons. In this case, we're looking at uh, point features. Those features are stored or grouped in something called a feature class. And then that feature class is part of a bigger data format, be it shapefile, geodatabase, CAD file, and so on. And then we're going to add that feature class to a map so that it creates a layer. The layer references back to the feature class. The layer doesn't store the data. It just controls how we're visualizing that information. So you can see here, I've got a manhole feature class, and I'm visualizing or symbolizing the data based on its condition. Is it fair, good, poor, or unknown? So again, layer's not storing the data. It's just controlling how we visualize it, right? So let's kind of jump into um, a desktop GIS application 
and see how this works. See if you can get a better visualization for the whole relationship between features, feature classes, and layers. Okay, so we're, we're back. We're in, uh, we're actually going to use ArcGIS Pro to uh, kind of take you through this, this concept. Uh, the same applies for ArcMap. Uh, same applies basically to QGIS, uh, MapInfo, and any other application out there. But we're going to use Arc Pro for the sake of this demonstration. So we're going to start out and, and again, talk about features and look at a feature. So you can see here I've got a map. Uh, I'm looking at parcels here. So each one of these items, each one of these boundaries represents an individual parcel. And this is a feature, right? So this is one feature. This big parcel here is one feature. This parcel, little parcel here is one feature and so on. So each one of these little boundaries, these polygons, are individual features. They are also linked back to the table. So each one of those polygons we're looking at has a record over here in our attribute table, which stores the various uh, information we want to associate with each feature. Um, again, this is as you design your data, you will choose what fields need to be here and all those kind of things. But you can see here for each parcel, I've got information for lot number, street number, uh, street name that it's off of, the suffix for the street, is it a street, a court, a way, and so forth. Uh, shape length, which would be the in uh, this situation, the perimeter around each individual parcel. Shape area, which would be um, the total area. In this case, it's going to be in square feet because I'm uh, the coordinate system I've assigned to this uh, feature class is uh, Georgia State Plain, which is uh, in feet. Uh, acres, self-explanatory, area in acres. I have not, I've got a field to hold the perimeter in whatever unit I want to. It's not been populated and so on. So we've got the various fields associated with each feature, right? So each one of these that you see here, right, coincides back to one of the rows you see here. So the feature is both geometry and tabular data. Okay. Now, all of this is stored, all of these features are stored in a feature class. So you see that here, I've got the parcels feature class sitting right here. And there's other feature classes that are in this geodatabase, right? So, uh, and this is something called a feature data set. It's just kind of an organizational container. Think of it as a folder within the geodatabase in, in layman terms. But you can see here, I've got the parcels feature class, the natural water stream feature class, natural water body feature class, county limit feature class, city limit feature class. So each one of these feature classes is going to contain groupings of related features like all of these in the railroad tracks or railroad center lines, right? All of these are parcel uh, parcel polygons for the area shown. Okay? So again, they're all stored in this feature class. And each one of these feature classes has properties, right? So we can see it's a file geodatabase feature class. That's the data type. We can see the database it's stored in. That's the source, the location. We can see the name of the feature class. We can see the alias, which is just a more descriptive name if needed. We can see what feature data set it was in, which was the base feature data set. Over here, base, that's the feature data set. So again, telling us where it's at. It's a simple uh, feature class, meaning it's just a, a, a point line or polygon. And in this case, it's a polygon. You can get into complex feature types, multi-feature multi things, um, and so on. Don't need to talk about that yet. Uh, we can also see that it's not storing Z or M values in here. So elevation or measured values. Uh, we're not going to discuss those here 
it does not have any attachments, so it doesn't have any links to photos or other documents and things. Those haven't been enabled. And feature binning is also uh, disabled. So uh, continuing down from the feature class, we can see the extent. So this is the minimum, maximum XY that this whole thing covers. Here's the spatial reference that I was telling you about. So we can see this is in NAD83, State Plain, Georgia West, FIPS. It's a transverse Mercator projection. Um, it uses U.S. survey feet. This is the false easting and northing. So all of the information about the coordinate system in the projection is stored here. So all the features in this feature class are in this coordinate system and projection. Okay. So we can see feature classes have other uh, properties. So we in, uh, get into indexes. Uh, I'm not going to go into that in this video that's a more complex um, thing. We can set up relationships between this feature class and another feature class we want to. That would be in here. And then location referencing, that would be if we had M values enabled, which we, we don't. So, But you can see the basic properties of the feature class. And so these, whatever setup in here, would proliferate down to the individual features here because these are all stored in this feature class. Right, which is then in turn stored in this feature data set, which is stored in this geodatabase. We can also go down and look at other types of data. So here's a CAD file. Here's a DWG file. So again, we can see that this feature uh, data type, or data format, I should say, stores multiple feature classes. And I can select and look at those. And even though it's a CAD file, you can see it's got spatial data coming in. I can look at the table because it does have attributes. These are fire hydrants we're pulling from or looking at, right? So again, we can see this one DWG file is storing multiple feature classes, but each one of those feature classes is a collection of features that share that same geometry and the same attribute table. Okay. Again, it doesn't matter that it's a DWG and not a uh, geodatabase. We can also go, let's see here if I can find a shape file somewhere. I'm sure I can. Yep, here we go. So here's a, another shape file. So you notice the green icon here. So this is a shape file. Notice this only stores one feature class. Unlike our geodatabase and our CAD file, this, there's no drop down or nothing uh, here to expand. It's a single feature class. But again, you can see there's the table. And here's the geometry showing the individual features. So now we're going to take that and expand it and go into a layer. Okay. So I've got this map that I've already created. And you can see there's the manhole layer that was in the slide we looked at earlier. And again, if I open the attribute table, you can see the attribute table down here. Right? And these two are linked together. So if I go up here in the map and I select that manhole, I'm going to make it so I'm only seeing the selected record down here. But there's the attribute record associated with that. If I select this manhole, this is the record associated with that manhole. So all of this data applies to that feature. When I select this one, this data applies to that feature. Okay. So this layer is referencing back to that feature class. And we can see if we right click on the layer and go to properties, we can go to source. And you can see here that that layer is pointing to a file geodatabase feature class that's the located in the tripville underscore GIS geodatabase. And it's the manhole feature class that's in the sewer feature data set. So if we go over here uh, into the catalog pane, you can see there's the tripville underscore GIS geodatabase. Here is the sewer feature data set. And I need to close that down to expand this. And there is the manhole feature class. So this layer here is referencing back to this feature class here. This map is not storing the data. It's pointing back to this data source. All of these different layers are going to point to their appropriate data source. 
You can also go in either Arc Pro or Arc Map in the contents and this little cylinder icon here is list by data sources. This will tell you where your layers are pointing to, where are they coming from. So you can see I've got uh, different sources for these two layers. These are coming from a, a folder, which means they're either a CAD file or a shape file. This little icon here, the little blue line connected to a little uh, vertical rectangle that looks maybe like a mini computer, these are web, uh, web services. So these sewer lines here are actually coming not locally anywhere on my machine, but actually pointing back to a, a service that's uh, hosted and coming via the web. Right, so all the sewer lines are coming from the web. My manholes, my railroads, my parcels are all coming from the Tripville GIS geodatabase. And then we have another web service. So our water system, uh, water lines or water service areas are also coming from a different web service. So I actually have two separate web services referenced in this one map. And then my base map is also coming from a web service via ArcGIS Online. So you can see here in a single map, each layer we have is coming or pointing to a different source. So again, if we had to try to store all of this into one single map, that would be, uh, the maps would be huge, right? And again, your, your system would then suffer as a result of having to load all of this into memory at one time for display and all that. So we just reference these data sources in. So we're never loading all of the data in so that as we pan and zoom, you know, it's going to determine what data is visible and load just that bit of data into our system. So we're never loading the whole thing in. This allows us to work with these big data sets and do so efficiently and effectively in a way that doesn't crash our system every time we try to use it saying GIS doesn't crash, but we can work with a lot bigger data sets than say AutoCAD can or MicroStation or whatnot. Um, it also allows us to pull data from different locations instead of everything having to be locally on our machine. We can pull things from the web. We can pull things from uh, servers, from relational databases and things all into one map. And again, uh, this just controls the visualization. You see when I select the layer, uh, the manhole layer up here, I get tabs that are appearing, so our appearance. I can go up here and change the symbology for the layer. Right now it's being symbolized based off of its condition. I could make it so they all look the same if I wanted to. right? Or maybe I want to symbolize it based off of some numeric value in there. So um, maybe based on depth, for example. So I get an idea of the depth of each manhole uh, in here. So that's again, just visualizing the data. I'm just controlling how I visualize it. If I want to, I'm gonna go back to my uh, values and the condition. Put that in there, I'm not gonna change everything back. But you're getting the idea. And that's just one part of it. I can also go over here and label each manhole. Again, this is just how I'm visualizing it with its manhole ID. Sure, I'm going to turn, uh, turn on those labels. And so now I'm, I'm, again, taking data, part of that attribute table, and visualizing the manhole ID associated with each manhole on here. I can go and control data. So if I want to turn off certain fields, so when people are opening the attribute table or identifying or, or whatnot, or clicking on just to get some information, you know, if I don't want them to see things like say the object ID, for example, which is a field in the database that's solely used by the software, right? It's really not something that you, the user, need to concern yourself about, nothing you can change or edit. So turn it off, why, why look at it? I can see it's read only anyway. Um, if there's other fields like shape, you already know it's a point because you can see based over here in the contents what type of data it is, you can turn that off. And this is controlling the visibility of those fields in the attribute table. So once I save this change and close that down, when I reopen that attribute table, you can see down here that those fields, the shape field and the object ID field, which were at the start, are not visible, right? So again, that's all the layer is doing is controlling how those, uh, how the features in that 
feature class, the layer references are, are displayed. And there's a lot of other things we can do uh, here. So again, if we go to properties, there's another way I can go down here and do a definition query. So I'm filtering out data. So I only see where um, depth is equal to, or I say greater than or equal to four. Okay. So again, I'm filtering out. So now I'm only seeing those manholes that are four feet or greater in depth. Okay. Again, I'm just controlling the visualization. All of the data is still there. I'm just filtering it out. So it's only visualizing those that meet that definition query. So this is part of the layer. I'm going to go ahead and remove that. Okay. So now we'll see all of them again. Okay. So hopefully that gives you a much better idea of the relationship between features, feature classes, and layers. Um, and I should point out that a layer is going to be stored in a map. And that layer, which references a feature class, can be used in multiple maps, which is another reason we do this in GIS, why we keep things separate. Um, because we utilize that same data across the board in multiple maps and multiple projects and so forth and so on. Um, so anyway, I hope that's cleared some things up. And now you have a much better understanding of what a feature is, what a feature class is, and what a layer is. These are very core concepts, kind of foundational concepts to anyone getting started in GIS. Because it, as I said earlier, it's very different. Uh, the way we do things in GIS is compared to what you would do um, in other applications, in AutoCAD, MicroStation, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, any of those out there. So um, with that, uh, again, thank you. Hope you've learned a lot. Uh, if there's anything we can do to help you uh, with GIS, please reach out to us. We're always here to help. We offer a full breadth of GIS-related consulting services, whether you're just trying to get off the ground implementing GIS, or maybe you have an existing GIS that you want to expand into the enterprise, we can help you with that. If you're trying to integrate GIS with other solutions like work order management, utility billing, uh, permitting, whatever, we can help you with that. If you're just trying to figure out how to even get started or maybe take your GIS to the next level and you need a, a plan, a needs assessment, we can do that for you as well. Uh, maybe you've got a big project coming up and you don't have enough staff or maybe um, you need some GIS work going and, and you don't, um, there's nobody near you. We can help you with Renatech services so we can augment your existing staff or provide you with maybe uh, your very first GIS uh, staff person there. Uh, we can do that remotely or on site, however you need that. And of course we offer training and support. So um, if you need a safety net, on how to do some of these things or whatnot, we can certainly set you up with a good support contract. Um, if you need help getting your staff up to speed on say ArcGIS Pro or, or ArcGIS Enterprise or Arc Online or whatever, we can certainly help you with that. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Here's our contact information. You've got our website at www.egisassociates.com. Give us a call at 678-710-9710 or email us at info at egisassociates.com. So, with that, thanks so much. If you like the video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our channel and hit that little bell so you get notifications when we post new videos. I do apologize. It's been a little while since we posted one, but there have been a lot of crazy things here happening at EGIS that hopefully I'll be able to tell you about uh, very soon. So with that, y'all have a great day and Hope everyone has a very happy and merry holiday, whatever you, you choose to celebrate. And we'll see you in the next year.